Hello and welcome to the thir third episode of uh, Range of Science. Ewa Yablonka is our guest today. Uh, Ewa is professor in the Kohn Institute of uh, Kohn Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas at Tel Aviv University. Uh, she is outstanding uh, evolutionary theorist and geneticist. Uh, she is uh, considered as uh, world's uh, foremost expert in epigenetic inheritance and evolution and has, has written uh, numerous papers and books on the subject. Uh, it is a great honor to have you on my podcast, Eva. Thanks for participating. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I would like to start with uh, soft inheritance. A uh, growing number of evolutionary biologists have uh, suggested that a uh, paradigm of uh, neo-Darwinian modern synthesis is somewhat incomplete and uh, uh, they proposed extended evolutionary synthesis. One of the things that you contributed was soft inheritance, the idea that uh, acquired uh, characteristics uh, can be transmitted uh, uh, through generations. It is impossible within uh, uh, Darwinian, neo-Darwinian paradigm. And uh, uh, I would like to, you to give uh, our viewers a brief overview of uh, uh, this idea, soft inheritance, and what were uh, the discoveries and experiments behind uh, this uh, idea. So it's not a new idea, it's quite an old idea, which was rejected for a very long time because it was supposed to be uh, non-validated. It, uh, it was supposed to have no supportive uh, uh, evidence, and it was also supposed to be biologically impossible. It was supposed, it was, the assumption was that, you, that something that happened during your lifetime cannot be passed on to your offspring. The offspring, in a sense, start as a genetic uh, empty slate, clean slate. So I don't know uh, how, I, I, I don't want to go into bio, uh, biochemical details here, but I want to explain the difference between genetic and epigenetic inheritance with a metaphor. So if you think about genetic inheritance as a kind of uh, potential that can be realized in many ways, depending on the environment, depending on all kinds of circumstances. So, for, so this is like, let's say, a musical score. Musical score is something that, you, uh, that gives you, the, uh, it is a written piece of music, and you can perform it in many, many different ways. But and the inheritance of this score is by copying it. From generation to generation, it is copied. So what is copied is the actual score, not the interpretation of the score. This is like DNA. You, DNA is like the score of the musical piece, and you copy it every generation, sometimes with mistakes. Yes, this happens. But basically, this is you. you it, it's completely... A, a copying of a potential, not of an interpretation. Yeah. Now imagine that you have a new technology. You can record, tape and record, like we are doing here. So it is not just the score that can be transmitted, but you can transmit now the actual an actual performance. Yes, through a recording. It's a di it's a different technology. You still have the old technology the technology of copying the score itself, but you also can now copy a particular interpretation from one generation to the next. You have a new technology. Now, epigenetic inheritance is a little bit like the copying of the interpretation. So in more kind of formal way uh, or more uh, uh, jargon <laughs> laden well, uh, way, you can say that what is in inherited is not only the, the sequences of the DNA, but also how these sequences are actually interpreted by the organism during development. And this is epigenetic inheritance. Now, there are many mechanisms for epigenetic inheritance. It has more than one mechanism. They are complicated biochemically. And epigenetic inheritance sometimes is not very long-term. Sometimes you can inherit this interpretation 
this gene expression patterns for one generation, for two generations, for three, sometimes for many, many generations. It differs in different circumstances for different organi for different uh, for, di for, for different types of organisms also. It is, for example, so it seems, according to what we know now, can be inherited for a longer time in plants than, for example, in mammals. We're not sure about it because we don't have the full uh, understanding and the full data about it, but this is at the moment what we believe. And I will give you, I will give you some examples uh, of, uh, of, the, of epigenetic inheritance. I think examples are always helpful. So let us, I will give you an example actually in mammals, in mice. So other male mice that when they were babies, they were traumatized by temporary separation from their mothers. And the, and the mother herself was also traumatized so that when she came back to them, she was not a very good mother. She was a bit neurotic, yes? And this happened for the first 14 days. They, when they grow up, they become also a little bit neurotic. This is not very surprising. In early, uh, bad experience is leading to all kinds of problems. Now, if you take this mice and make them with a, with, with a female that never, that, that, uh, and this female was never stressed herself, she's okay, and she has offspring from this mice, from this male mice that were traumatized and uh, are traumatized, then although they give, the only thing that they give to the mother is their sperm, their offspring too will have a tendency to be neurotic, like their fathers, although they only received the stuff that is in the sperm itself. They didn't receive any parental care from, the, from mice because there's no parental care in mice, paternal care in mice. They received only whatever it is in the sperm. The DNA is the same, but they received something extra. They received some epigenetic factors through the sperm that make that lead to the development of this kind of neurosis, and this can and this kind of of inheritance can be transmitted for two and sometimes three generations, sometimes longer. Okay, so this is an example of epigenetic inheritance. In this case, it is mediated by the factors that mediate it are small RNAs. These are small molecules and also methylation patterns, something that is superimposed on the DNA. This is one example. I will give you another in plants, for example. You can do all kinds of things in plants that you can't do in animals. And you can, you can um, construct plants that are identical, totally, totally identical genetically. They are exactly the same. The only difference between them is the epigenetic patterns that they have superimposed on the DNA. These patterns are called methylation patterns. It doesn't matter. It just marks that are superimposed on the DNA itself and that make a difference to gene expression. Now, when you're looking at these patterns, you can actually see and you can look how, how well they are inherited. This is one thing. The other thing that you can do is see for how, for how long they are inherited. What is the rate of mistakes in the transmission of these marks, yeah, methylation marks. And what you discover is that first, they, they are not transmitted with a great deal of fidelity, but it is something like one in 10,000, you have a mistake, not so bad. And you can do quite a lot of selection on I, totally genetically identical organisms but because they have variations and these variations are inherited from one generation to the next, the methylation variations are inherited, you can actually do selection, selection for epigenetic variations, not for DNA because the DNA is the same, right? So, and you can see that in some cases, this changed patterns of DNA, uh, of DNA methylation of the marks superimposed on DNA lead to changes, for example, in the height of the plant or in uh, how broad the roots of the plants are and things like this. 
So it does have effects. It's not just something that happens and doesn't have any effect on, on, on traits that are important for reproductive success. It is important for rep reproductive success. So this is another example. And there are many, many examples like that. So it's not just that I'm taking here and there because the number of sites in this plant that can be different from each other in terms of the methylation, the number of variants is enormous. We're talking about millions of variations, of possible variations at the level of a single mark. At the level of regions, we're talking about 7,000, 10,000. And that's in a small plant with a small genome, right? So we have this kind of inheritance and it exists, it seems to exist in plants, in fungi, in animals, almost everywhere. Everywhere you look, you find it. Now, why it was overlooked is a very interesting question. And it has to do with complicated, it, it has to do with many things. It has to do with the fact that it is not as stable as genetic inheritance on the one hand. On the other hand, it has a lot to do with the politics of science, with the kind of things that were supposed to be true. Well, it's, it is dependent on the kinds of experiment that people did, what they were looking for. If you are looking for something under the, um, uh, under the light of the torch, that's what you will find, right? I mean, uh, I, and, and many, many, there were many interacting reasons for why this kind of inheritance was not supposed to be of any importance, neither to heredity, nor to evolution. This situation is changing. You are advocate of a uh, four-dimensional view of evolution. Uh, that idea that uh, natural selection acts not, not just on gene level, but also on epigenetic level, as we talked, and behavioral and symbolic levels. Uh, my question is, what are units of selection replicators in case of behavioral and symbolic levels of selection? There have been suggestions like meme theory, uh, and what's your idea on that, and what's your own approach to behavioral and symbolic levels of uh, selection? Yeah, so I think that, you know, when I'm thinking about, uh, for example, let's, let's take a trait. Let's take a trait like, uh, uh, I don't know what you like to eat in Georgia, but I guess that you have your own cuisine, yeah. right? And this cuisine is something that is part of your identification as people. And it is something that is transmitted from one generation to the next. Yeah. In, uh, from, uh, and uh, and it, it, of course, with variations, you add things, you detract, uh, things are added, but uh, there is something that you can call the Georgian cuisine, right? Now, when you're trying to think, let's say, I, 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 now I don't know much about Georgian cuisine. I ate a little bit. We have Georgian restaurants in, uh, in Israel, but, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist. I'm not uh, a connoisseur. But let's say that uh, you are, the, so now I'm inventing a story around around this, uh, uh, around this. And let's say that people like you, like other Georgians, they prefer this Georgian food. If they are given a choice between this food and other foods, they much, much, much prefer the Georgian food to other food. Now, why do they prefer it? So there can be all kinds of things. In the case of food preferences, sometimes for some food preferences, we know that there can be even genetic differences between populations. That in some populations, certain things that are aversive to one population can be non-aversive to other populations because of genetic reasons. I suppose this is not the case, by the way. Mm -hmm. But we also know that there can be epigenetic uh, differences. So you, when you are in a, an embryo, you are exposed to the foods that your mother gave, uh, ate. And you developed recept and the kind of recept and during your development, you developed particular receptors that you uh, that were induced as a result of this uh, of the kind of uh, food traces that you got we know for example that children that were ex that uh, uh, received the uh, arrow to juice during the pregnancy of the mother when they are given a choice later on 
after they are born, they prefer carrot juice to water. Children that didn't get carrot juice during, their preg during pregnancy will not prefer it. Now, what exactly is the basis here? We don't know, but it is presumably something epigenetic because it is ge different gene expression is involved. I'm not saying that it is necessarily inherited through the germline. This is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it is constructed during very, very early development and it has very, very long-term effects. Now, in addition to that, in a culture, it's not the, the genetic epigenetic. This is what you eat. This is what your mother gives you. This is what gives you, this is what other kids eat. You, you know, this, is, this, this gives you the pleasure of, uh, of being uh, satiated and you develop a liking for it unless uh, something nasty happens to you and you know that either you have food poisoning or something like this, then you will not like it, but otherwise you will like it. And also it is something of, a, of, 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 of identity in the case of humans. This is something that identifies you as part of this particular cultural group. It is something good cooks are respected, good restaurants, people go to good restaurants, there is a whole cultural thing around it. You grow the kind of uh, vegetables and animals that, that, that you use in cooking. You use particular type of spices, so you have to grow the spices and so on. So there is a whole industry around it. It's a very complicated thing that is happening here. Now, how do, can we think about it? Shall we think, in this case, probably genetics is not involved, but maybe. Maybe there is some kind of genetics. There. But it can be very, very easily... Maybe if you, even if you have a genetics there, if you have an aversion, the fact that you have a genetic predisposition will not help you. You will still hate the food, right? So, so, so there is some, maybe there is some epigenetic component, maybe, probably, yes, it's very, very likely. Most things have an epigenetic component. Whether it is inherited uh, through the germline or not is at the moment irrelevant. For sure, there is a behavioral in her, a component here certain ways of behaving towards food. And of course there is a cultural one. So how should we think about it? Genetic, epigenetic behavior, symbolic things sort of interact. The interaction may be more than the sum of the parts. The, it may be synergetic kind of interaction, yes? So the stability of the cultural element can be much, much greater of the kind of trade that we're talking about, the preference for the local food tradition, may be greater than the some of the parts that contribute to it because they form a system. And in this system, you have all kinds of complicated interactions. So I think that we can look at these things in two ways. We can, uh, we can separate if we want. Mm -hmm. So I can say, look, I'm not interested what goes into it. I just want to look at the culture. That's it. I don't want to analyze it further. I'm, I'm looking at the cultural aspect that go into it, and that's it. That's okay. You will find, you will, but you will miss something. You will miss, for example, the epigenetic components. You look at the epigenetic components, you will miss the cultural component. You, you are likely to miss some of the cultural components, but you know, you will get information through this thing. I'm not saying that this is useless. It is not useless. But I think that the best way of, doing, of, of going about it is first start with the package. See how what we, I call heritably varying trait is transmitted, uh, how it is transmitted from one generation to the next. And then I can an, I analyze the components and how they interact. So this is what I'm suggesting. This is how I think about it. Uh, your uh, recent works and papers are about um, uh, consciousness. Um, when I had first episode with Chris Fried, he said that according to you, uh, consciousness, uh, at least uh, um, primary consciousness started in Cambrian explosion. Um, um, there is no universal consensus uh, currently about definition or nature of consciousness, but uh, um, and nonetheless, we can, um, uh, according to your theory, we can uh, um, uh, we can uh, postulate what is uh, what are some uh, 
hallmark properties of consciousness, like there is similar research in origins of life. Uh, um, let's introduce our viewers what, is, uh, what are hallmark properties of consciousness according to unlimited associative learning framework and what is uh, uh, positive, single positive markers that requires uh, uh, other properties to exist. Yeah, so the way that we tried, it's a very difficult question. The consciousness question is very difficult. I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I think, so my tool is, so I'm using evolutionary biology in order to understand very basic problems in biology, in psychology, in, even in culture, in culture too. So I looked, it's not just me, I did this work. I mean, the work on epigenetics I did with Marion Lamb, so it, it should not be attributed just to me. And the work that I did on consciousness is I did with uh, Sim uh, Simona Ginsburg. So when I say I, I really mean we, yeah. okay? okay. Uh, so because it's a very, very difficult question, we, are, we approached it by trying to look at comparable problems in biology and how they were dealt with. So a similar, in some ways problem in biology, very different, but similar in terms of the problems that it, uh, it creates is the problem of the origin of life. There is no definition of life that is accepted by everybody. But, the, but there are some characteristics of life that a lot, a lot of people would agree on. For example, that there should be some kind of metabolism, that there should be some kind of closure, some kind of something that separates the entity from its environment, that there should be some kind of regulation, that uh, there should be some kind of, in, uh, of subsystem that have information about the system, that, and, and so on. And now that people are going, for example, to, to Mars, there is this, uh, I mean, we send this, uh, there is this robot that is now uh, in Mars and is drilling into the areas where people thought, believe, that there may be some remnants of past life because there was water there. What are they looking for? They are actually looking for something that will give, that will indicate to them that something like metabolism, like membrane, like sub, uh, subsystem of, uh, 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 of information was actually in place, right? So not necessarily DNA, although maybe, because maybe something completely different and maybe not a membrane as we know it, but something like that. Maybe some components from which we can reconstruct a metabolic cycle that creates all the animals. Now, it's not only that now. So the, the, there is a kind of list of things that we say, if we find this component on any other planet, we will say, well, there is not, there's quite a good chance that there was life on this planet. Yeah. And we can, tr and we can in, in an intelligent way, try and figure out how this components created a system that we can call a life because the components, of course, are not alive. DNA is not alive. The cell is alive, yeah. right? Yeah. The same, so there was a, a very, very, in my opinion, important, uh, a theoretical chemist called Tibor Ganti in Hungary, who was thinking, who thought in, in terms of trying to, un to understand how once you have certain characteristics, a list of characteristics of life, what kind of, how will these characteristics come together, interact with each other to form something like a cell, like a cell, very, very, very primitive, very, very, very simple, but nevertheless, with some of the basic properties of life as we know it, as we know it, that's the only thing that we can at the moment imagine. And, and then he also tried to think which property is something that is, is a kind of diagnostic for sustainable life. And he and after him, uh, Minot Smith and Er Satmary. Er Satmary was a student of his. Minot Smith was a very, very famous evolutionary biologist. 
and Maynard Smith and Ernst Ottmarie worked together. And following Gandhi, they suggested that there is such a property for life, and this is what they called unlimited heredity. If you have a hereditary system within this entity, which Gandhi called the chemotome, if you have something like this, then in order to have something that gives you a lot of heritable variations, it is not unlimited in any mathematical sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is unlimited only in the sense that there are a lot, a lot, a lot, millions and millions of possible variations so that the number of variations is much larger than the number of environments than that the system can meet. If you have such a system with a lot, a lot of variations, it needs to be isolated from the environment. It needs to have metabolism. It needs to have all the properties that are characteristic of life. So this is the kind of evolutionary marker of life. So we thought, well, first of all, let's see what is, is, is there any consensus, not about the definition, because there is no consensus about the definition of consciousness. But is there any consensus similar to the consensus about life? So if we go to another planet and find things, creatures, entities that behave in a certain way, that, that have certain, certain capacities, what capacities will be, indic which, which capacities will, list of capacities or joint list of capacities will lead us to say, well, it is likely that these organisms, that these things, are conscious and we should not hurt their feelings, okay? We don't want to hurt them because they may feel. Yeah, and we're talking about the very, very simplest thing, the ability to have subjective experience, not the ability to think about thinking, which is what we do. So we tried, so we looked at the literature and we tried to see what kind of things people are talking about and where do, do these things overlap more or less? What will be a list like this? And we came with the list. Now you can disagree about, people can add some things or detract some things and the things, the capacities that we came, uh, that we identified were sort of overlapping. So <laughs> one capacity to some extent overlaps another capacity. And that is good because it already hints that we're talking about the system. Right, when you have this overlapping things, it's interesting. It's not just, a, uh, it's not, it's not just a shopping. Thing. So we came with a list of uh, several uh, capacities. For example, uh, the, the, the creature or whatever it is, has to have the ability to perceive things as unified. So when you see an apple, it is both red and round, for example. And, but at the same time, you, you have to have the capacity to differentiate between different structures and, and, and different combined holes and change the, and because things change all the time. Yeah? So you have to have the ability for both unification and differentiation. This is one capacity. The other is there, there need to be some kind of global uh, accessibility to this thing so that you know, if you have different modalities, sensory modalities such as hearing and, and, uh, and seeing and tasting, they can come together to form a totality. And you can also do operations on them. You can generalize, for example, you can compare, you can discriminate. This is very, very, very important. And uh, then you need to have a, a flexible value system. So that things are not just fixed. Something is not always good. Sometimes it is good. In this circumstances, this apple is good. In other circumstances, it's very bad. Yes? Yeah. It, it, it depends. It, or this place is very good now, but in other circumstances, it can be a very dangerous place, and so on and so forth. So you have to have this flexible value system. Uh, you have to have some kind of flexible attention so to select from the environment what you attend to because you are bombarded by sensory information all the time. So there must be a system that sort of sorts and excludes a lot of stuff. And you need to represent them. There must be some kind of representation of the, of the world within the organism that is changing, that is flexible, not only of the world, but also of the organism itself as it interacts with the world. So you need to have this too. 
And you need, and, and in order to experience, again, where I'm talking as, uh, about consciousness as we know it, subjective experience as we know it, we, there needs to be something that we call temporal depth. So that everything, ha- the present is not an infinite second of time. It has, it, it is felt, it has a duration. Mm-hmm. It is something that many, many philosophers, especially phenomenologists, put their finger on. For example, William James. So you have to have this uh, uh, temporal depth. You have to have something that is co- that you can call a self a, and, and a perspective from which you can see, perceive and compare things. And to make a distinction between yourself and the world. Mm-hmm. Right? All these things are necessary. If we found it, uh, all these things were highlighted by different people. And most people will, I think most people will agree that if we find some, a creature like that somewhere, we will say that it is probably a, 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 a creature with minimal consciousness, right? So this is the list. Now the question is, can we find, now how can we study this? We can study each of these capacities separately in different organisms in order, for example, to answer the question, how is consciousness distributed in the living world? Who who is conscious, who is not conscious? Very, very difficult thing to do. It would be much easier if we have a diagnostic kind of feature, a marker like unlimited heredity, that will give us a, that that once we have it, we say, well, if you have this, for sure, it is very very. It, you're probably you. It requires all these things. So if you have a property from which you can reverse engineer into all the properties that I have mentioned, then this will be real marker. So we were looking at it. We've spent a long a whole year looking for it. Starting from the molecular level, it gave us nothing because we didn't know where to look. There's too much. We looked at morphology, at brains, but we didn't. But again, there are so many things you can look at. We didn't know what we didn't know what to look. And then we came to the something that we called, following Gandhi, unlimited associative learning. Now, unlimited associative learning is learning by association, so that one thing predicts another thing. It's conditional learning where the stimulus that is predictive is complex. It is not very, very it's, it's made up of many of the components, many com- no, different, several different components that can be organized in different ways. And an organism with unlimited associative learning can discriminate between different organization of complex holes like this. And a, a unlimited associative learning also uh, uh, in order to have unlimited associative learning, you also need to have a flexible value system so that one this complex hole that is predictive of something can be predictive of different things, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and you change your value. It also requires that, you, there, that there can be a time gap between the when when you see the when you perceive the predictive the predictive signal and you get the reinforcement, there can be some time gap between it. So there is a kind of integration over time and the uh, ability to, if you learn one thing, you can use whatever you learned in order to learn something else. For example, you like nice food and then you can, you, can, you also find out that, uh, that, uh, that you can, that money, can buy you nice food, so you start liking money. Yeah? <laughs> we have to be careful about it, but what can we do? Right, something like that. But of course, I'm. this is a human example, but they're non-human examples. Now, we ask ourselves, okay, we have here a cluster of capacities. And we argued, and I will not give you the whole argument here because we don't have time, that if you have this unlimited associative learning with these four capacities, then all the features that I was talking about must be in place, all of them. So it's a good marker. And this is something that we can actually check because it's a a kind of learning that is not that complicated. So who has it? 
So we can start looking at it. We can start looking at the literature on learning, which is expensive. The last 150 years of, uh, of comparative psychology and see what people know. Of course, people were not looking at things from this point of view, but they were looking at this aspect of learning in many, many different organisms, right? So we did that. So we, we said this, this unlimited associative learning, again, it is not unlimited. Of course, it, it has there are a lot of constraints, but still you can learn a lot of things if you have this capacity because it is a generative system, a combinatorial system, right? So you can learn quite a lot of things and, uh, and many, many more things than you can, will ever meet in your life. That's the important point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we argued that this is a good marker for consciousness. And then we could, as I said, because we could look at the literature and see how, what people found out about the kind of animals that have, that can do it and the kind of animals that can't do it, we can say something about the distribution of, uh, of this unlimited associative learning, which we call UAL in the living world. And we can also infer when it first appeared during evolution. Uh, you also postulate that uh, uh, associative learning did not just originate in uh, Cambrian explosion, but it was a major driving force of uh, Cambrian explosion. Um, uh, can you explain in what ways uh, it gave advantage to uh, organisms uh, uh, that uh, caused a massive expansion of life? What was the fitness? Uh, advantages yeah. to it. So, it, you know, it's, uh, right. So first of all, I want to say that when we did look and uh, the, when we looked at the, uh, at, the, at the kind of animals that have this type of learning, we saw that it is uh, present in most of the vertebrates, mm. in some arthropods, so insects, some insects, for example, and it is, uh, and in some of the mollusks, very few mollusks, the colloid cephalopods. These are the uh, the squid, the uh, the octopus, yeah. and the, the and the cuttlefish. Yes. They can learn in this way. And then we've tried to see when did this, and it is also associated with brain structures that can allow the kind of integration that we require, the kind of controls that are required for this learning to take place. Now, when we looked at when the, this kind of uh, uh, animals and with this kind of brains first appeared, we found that they appeared in the Cambrian which is 540 million years ago, in the arthropods and in the vertebrates. Mm -hmm. In the mollusks, they appeared 250 million later. Now, we were very interested in the fact that they appeared in the, uh, in the, that the arthropods and the vertebrates, they, uh, they, they uh, manifest this property, this, uh, the brain structures, and, uh, that, and uh, we know that, uh, current arthropods and vertebrates are able to do UA, to, be, uh, to learn by UAL. We're very interested uh, in it because the Cambrian explosion was the great explosion of new, uh, uh, of new forms of life, of new phyla. All, almost all the animal phyla that we know about, almost, not all, but almost all of them, appeared during the Cambrian in a relatively short period of time from an evolutionary perspective. So we wondered whether they just appeared in the Cambrian or maybe they were also instrumental yeah. in, mm -hmm. uh, in driving the Cambrian explosion to some extent. There are many reasons for it. The Cambrian explosion is again, a very complicated phenomenon and many things contributed to it. So we're not saying that only 
and uh, associative learning or and especially unlimited associative learning contributed to it. What we're saying is that it could have been one of the factors and why? Because animals that learn in this way can anticipate, become very, very, they not only see a predator and run away, they can anticipate whether there is a predator or not. They can anticipate whether there is, they can learn all the signals that are anticipatory about it. And this gives them a huge advantage because they can react much more quickly. They can remember, they can build on what, in the same way that we, once we learn something, we have a huge advantage, right? We can use this uh, knowledge, this acquired knowledge that we have in order to find a, a, a good place to hide or a good place from which what, uh, to attack, know what to eat, know what to avoid and so on and so forth. So we are, so we are a, a, an animal that has this capacity is, is a frightening animal for creatures that don't have this capacity, right? It can lead to extinction unless they evolve very quickly to, to, somehow, to, uh, to somehow cope with these monsters from their point of view. So we, th so we think that what happened that once you had this uh, 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 associative learning and especially the unlimited associative learning, there was it when, when organisms can learn during their own lifetime, not just during evolution, mm -hmm. not just through mm -hmm. mutation uh, selection, mutation selection which takes a long time, but during their own lifetime and use this in an adaptive manner then this exerted huge pressure and led to an arms race. So it is possible that the arthropods were the first to, to evolve it and the, and the vertebrates very, very soon co-evolved the same kind of learning, associative learning to run away. Yeah. If the arthropods were the dominant uh, 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 clade during the Cumbrian. The vertebrates were little fish, vegetarian. Later on, <laughs> this changed, but uh, that's what, but they had to learn, otherwise they would go extinct. Yeah. And there are many, many other kinds of uh, coevolution. For example, some animals evolve very quickly, all kinds of poisons, to be, to become, or, or camouflage, or all kinds of, uh, of adaptations in order to, to protect themselves from the, uh, from the uh, associative learning animals. There was a very big arms race. And we think that this arms race is part of the explanation for the Cumbrian explosion. It also uh, led to the, it led to many things in, uh, uh, for example, the evolution of sensory, better sensory abilities and better motor abilities. All these things co-evolved with each other. And learning was a very important driving case. Uh, 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 driving force here. Um, what are predictions of three main predictions of unlimited associative learning? So we have quite a lot of predictions in fact. If, uh, first of all, if, limit, if unlimited associative learning is really associated with consciousness, then we expect that under conditions where an animal or a human being is unaware is unconscious of a particular stimulus, it would not be able to learn it. Mm -hmm. So for example, under conditions of masking, there is something uh, that is called masking and that is when you expose an animal to some, sig uh, to some, to some perceptual signal, but you don't, but you do it so quickly or you distract the animal so that it, so if that, it, for a, a human, and you ask the human, did you see anything? And the human say, no, nothing. If this is a simple, uh, if, if this is a simple percept or something that was already uh, genetically inbuilt into you, you can learn it. You, it. you can be conditioned to it. But if it is not, if it's something new and complex, to which you have to attend, you will not be able to discriminate under these conditions. This is one of our predictions. And indeed, the experiment that exists supports it. You will also not be able to learn 
uh, to, to do uh, the conditioning where there is a time gap between the conditioned stimulus and the reinforcement. You will not be able to, to learn it under conditions of masking and so on, okay? So this is a strong prediction that we have. As far as we know, in humans, it is supported. And people are beginning to do experiments in animals in order to, to test for it. Mm -hmm. but, we, but this is a very strong prediction of ours, for example. Oh, uh, that uh, no. uh, learning requires consciousness, yeah? This type of learning. This type of learning. Not all learning. There are types of learning, simple types of learning don't require consciousness. Yeah, um, yeah like you know, immune system, for example, it can... Yes, but it's a very simple type of learning. It also has this uh, strange property of discriminating between self and non-self without any consciousness. Well, the, the nervous system has many properties, but it cannot learn by association. Yeah, it's different process entirely. Yeah. Yes, hmm. it's a wonderful system, and by the way, it co-evolved with the with the nervous system. Yeah. It's uh, really, if you if you are a developmental biologist, you realize that uh, it's very difficult to tease these things apart, and also in evolution, uh, it's uh, they co-evolved very very closely. Um, that's it. Thank you, Eva. It was very, very interesting and uh, it was like a journey. <laughs> Thank you very much.